Thank you everyone for joining in person and online. So today we're joined by Dr. Kelly Moran, who's working at the Los Alamos National uh, Laboratory. And we were discussing just now, and it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, Kelly actually kind of kicked off her career there as a post baccalaureate student in uh, 2015. Then she went to Duke University to study her PhD in statistics. And this was done with the support of the Departments of Energy's um, uh, com Computational Sciences uh, Graduate Fellowship. And each summer while she was at Duke, she actually kind of returned to, to Los Alamos, like I'm saying like a little bit like a homing pigeon uh, each summer, but different projects within the statistics group. And then finally in 2020, she joined as a full staff member. So the previous things that uh, Kelly's worked on, we might hear some of that today, is in varied fields such as you know, disease modeling and forecasting. She uh, contributed to the US's um, flu forecasting model, for instance. But today we're going to hear more about her current work, I believe, and that's on building statistical models for cosmology, particularly emulators of the matter power spectrum of the universe. So uh, without further ado, um, feel free to get started when you're ready, Kelly. Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, so I'm going to mostly focus on the cosmic emulator, um, but mm -hmm. at the end I'll have a couple of slides sort of talking about how you can use some of the the concepts that went into the cosmic emu for other applications. And this is meant to be kind of tutorial style to some extent, so going in depth into how we actually built this emulator. Um, and I probably won't be able to see the chat, so feel free to interrupt me with questions throughout. Um, and I'll try to remember to stop occasionally to ask if there are questions. So this is maybe preaching to the choir uh, for this group, but. The motivation here is to understand the fate of the universe. So the, the universe is expanding, but for a while, people who were worried about the fate of the universe thought that there were a few different things that could happen. Um, the expansion maybe would decelerate to the point where the universe would collapse. Uh, the expansion would decelerate to the point where you'd achieve kind of a constant size, um, or the expansion would decelerate, but in such a way that the universe would continue to expand slowly. Uh, but in the late 90s, observations of distant objects became available and people started to see something else entirely. And that was that this expansion seemed to be accelerating. Um, yeah, so something had to be causing this acceleration. So people came up with uh, many explanations that we still need to test. But the name given to these explanations, which is entirely straightforward and not mysterious at all, is dark energy. So we don't actually know, as I mentioned, all of the, the settings of the universe, so like why and how this expansion is happening, what's the percentage of dark matter, what's the mass of massive neutrinos, what's the dynamical dark energy equation of state. Um, and so to explore these different possible universe settings, researchers use big simulations. Um, the problem here is that these big simulations are too slow to run at every possible setting or cosmology of interest, or to run within an estimation procedure like MCMC, uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, where you might be trying to fit sort of something to our actual observed universe to learn about those best settings. Um, and so I'll spend the rest of the talk here covering how to build an approximation to a simulator called an emulator, which is getting at this question of how to approximate the results of these computa computationally intensive simulations. So uh, our answer to this question was the cosmic emu, which is able to predict the matter power spectrum for new cosmologies. Uh, there's a paper out on this, which is uh, about to be published in MNRIS. Um, I think the preprint is online and the code is publicly available at LAML's GitHub. Um, yeah, and so uh, this is all public and the rest of my talk, save for the last few slides, is gonna focus on how we built this EMU. So there's two main steps to creating the cosmic EMU. The first is running a set of simulations upon which the emulator can be trained. And the second, which I'll talk about in much more detail, is building the emulator. So first, there's this question of how to choose what simulations to run, so what settings to try. Um, and a common choice is a space filling design, so something like Latin hypercubes or simple uniform sampling. 
uh, what we used was a nested space filling lattice that could be run in stages. Um, the idea here was that we were going to be running the computers for a really long time and we didn't want to wait you know, five years to be able to do our analysis. We wanted to be able to have checkpoints, uh, you know, at one and three years in to get a first rougher pass at the emulator. So the space filling nested lattice allows you to have a first set. Uh, here we had 36, I believe, uh, settings that you could treat as sort of a standalone space filling design and then add an additional um, 75 runs to then create a complete 111, 111 simulation set. Um, and both of those separately would still be, you know, uh, space filling on their own. The simulation design itself has eight parameters, which um, include things like the percentage of matter, uh, the percentage of baryonic matter, and then there's uh, parameters for the constant and dynamical dark energy equations of state and a parameter for massive neutrinos. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the final complete design included 111 parameter settings, uh, 111 cosmologies. So then you take this set of inputs, these 111 settings, you stick them in a supercomputer, uh, initialize the particles of these in-body simulations according to some distribution that depends on some of the parameters. Um, and then at each time step, the computer calculates the forces between each particle, uh, largely gravity, but there's also some dark energy effects going on there. And then you wait, and you wait some more, uh, and you wait some more. And then eventually, uh, thousands of hours later, you get out the simulation results. Um, and the, the main result that we're going to be focusing on here and focusing on emulating is the matter power spectrum. Uh, the matter power spectrum, which uh, a realization from the simulation is shown here on the right, describes the density contrast of the universe. So that's the difference between the local density and the mean density as a function of scale. Um, it's also the Fourier transform of the matter correlation function. Um, so there's two problems here. One, the realized spectrum is noisy. So you can see on the right, it's uh, jagged. And this is unrealistic and washes out features that we know should be there and that we care about. And the, the second issue, which you know we're addressing with the emulator, is that this took a really long time to get. Um, so we need to first figure out what smooth thing we're approximating, and then we need to figure out how to make it faster. And uh, we don't actually just have sort of one simulation per cosmology. We actually have sort of 18 different results. We have a perturbation theory, which is our sort of like you know, based on theory, this is what we know the matter power spectrum should look like. Um, we have 16 low resolution simulations, and then we have one high resolution simulation for each cosmology. Um, so I mentioned the cosmic emu involves two main steps. The first uh, we've now done, we ran a set of simulations. And now with those set of simulations, we're going to build the emulator. And that itself has sort of a, a multi-stage process. So first, uh, the transformation. So the um, spectra that are shown on the left here are sort of the, the raw matter power spectra from the simulations. But a region that we care about is the baryonic acoustic oscillation region. And that is sort of, I don't think I highlighted it. I probably should have. Um, that's this region where the uh, there's a pattern of wrinkles in the density distribution of the clusters of galaxies in the universe. And this region is pretty important for cosmologists because it helps them understand more about dark energy and provides sort of important information about the likely best fitting cosmology of the universe. And so there's this transformation that we can do um, where we take our raw matter power spectrum and we do a log transform and do some um, multiplicative effect by k, the wave number. And what that gets us is 
this transformed spectra on the right. Um, and you can see the BAO region is this uh, gold highlighted section here that's kind of like bumps in the matter power spectrum um, at sort of middling K. And in the, the left plot, the original, you don't actually really see those bumps much at all. So this transformation is just a direct transform that helps us uh, better see and capture this region that we care about. The next step uh, is to clean up this uh, kind of messy set of realizations. And what that means here is sort of cutting off uh, the realizations at specific values for K. So our perturbation theory we know is the, the kind of true theory-based already smooth uh, result for what the matter power spectrum should be at low K. So we only use perturbation theory at low K. And then the low resolution simulations are only valid for K up to about 0.25. So this um, sort of clutter zone in the middle between about 0.04 and 0.25 uh, is where we're using low res and high res. And then up at higher K, we're just using high resolution simulation results. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we have these noisy realizations of what we believe is a underlying smooth spectrum. So here, this notation is just to show that we, we see sort of these different realizations, um, which I'm subscripting by their type. So LR for low res, HR for high res, PT for perturbation theory. But what these are, are realizations of an underlying smooth spectrum, uh, which I'm denoting here by script P of C. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so how do we combine the noisy realized spectra? Uh, we do this using a two-layer process convolution. So the result of that uh, modeling is shown on the right here. Um, and I won't go into too much detail on this because I want the, the emulation piece to be the main focus of the talk, but to just provide sort of a high level overview, the idea behind a process convolution is to put sort of a flexible prior on smooth functions. Um, so there's two main components to a process convolution. There's a, a latent process here. This is just Gaussians, uh, so like impulse Gaussians, and a kernel smoother. And so what you can imagine is you have sort of like jagged impulses that you then kernel smooth, and you end up with this black line here, this smooth function. Um, we have something a little bit fancier because we're using a two-layer process convolution. Um, I think in the paper, we call it a deep process convolution function because deep is in, uh, but really it's just two layers. And so the, the formulation of this two-layer process convolution is that you have um, a main process convolution that is what you'd imagine here, uh, this impulse being kernel smooth, but that kernel itself is itself modeled by a process convolution to allow the width of that kernel parameter to change. Um, and what that does is it gets you as more capacity to have a wiggly baryonic acoustic oscillation region because the model can learn where the underlying smooth function should be more wiggly and where it's just super smooth and can be sort of like highly smoothed out. Um, yeah, so this is just showing that concept visually. So on the left, you have a, a matter power spectrum and on the right of the equal sign, you have the uh, kernel, matrix, which you can see the, the width narrows through that middle region, that baryonic acoustic oscillation region. And then on the right, uh, we have an impulse distribution, which for us was a uh, Brownian motion. And there's more details on that uh, in some backup slides if anyone has interest in seeing the equations. Um, but 
the result of this process convolution, if we do it for every cosmology, is that we now have a smooth spectrum for each cosmology. Um, so we have 111 smooth realizations of matter power spectrum. Um, okay, and so now I'm going to move on to the emulation piece, but I wanted to pause to see if anyone has any questions so far. Um, I suppose I've got maybe got a quick one. Yeah. So, so, so the act of smoothing, do you lose any data that way? Like, um, is, is, it, is it all good or does it have some downsides to that act of smoothing? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the for computational reasons, we don't propagate the uncertainty about the smoothing process into the emulation. Um, and to our knowledge, people are using the predictions from our emulator and haven't yet asked for uncertainty. But I think if we were to report um, uncertainty for our eventual like matter power spectrum predictions, that uncertainty would then not include the, the uncertainty about the process convolution. So I think that would be, yeah, that would be bad if, um, if we were interested in sort of a complete full accounting of that uncertainty. Do you have a feeling for what kind of scale the uncertainty is? Uh, so for for the process convolution, it is pretty small. Um, like the the function is actually pretty easy to smooth with this two layer process convolution, and the the predicted uncertainty is like negligible relative to the scale of say like the BAO wiggles. Um, so it doesn't appear that it's, you know, like you wouldn't get say a BAO wiggle that was in a different place that was just wrong or that was like on an order of magnitude incorrect in scale. Um, it might be like a percentage or less, which um, yeah, now that our emulator is getting so accurate, could start to matter more, um, but thus far hasn't really been sort of the bottleneck to getting good predictions. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna get to the meat of the process. Um, so the, the basic concept of the emulation component is that we're going to model our, our spectra using a orthogonal basis and a set of basis weights. Um, and then we're going to model those basis weights using Gaussian processes. So the visual is shown below. Sorry, the axis labels are kind of tiny. Um, but this is just to give a sense for sort of the concept. So you, you center scale and project the spectra onto some basis. Um, we're using principal components, and then you have your basis weights, and you have GPs, and that is kind of the like punchline for the whole thing. Um, so for yeah, I, some people prefer pictures, some people prefer equations. Here's the the basic concept again, just restated in equation form. So our original spectrum script P um, is shown in this top equation here. I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse. Um, so in this step, we're centering and standardizing the, the spectra. Um, we then have a standardized spectrum for each cosmology. We get an orthogonal basis uh, representation of those spectra. Um, and then we have a set of orthogonal bases uh, and their associated basis weights, which I'm showing here as W and we model each W using a Gaussian process. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with GPs already, you might be thinking, why aren't you just modeling your spectra using Gaussian processes? Uh, the issue is that the spectra are, you know, let's see, something like a few thousand uh, dimensional all by themselves. And so if you, 
had your 2000 dimensional uh, curves, and then you have 111 uh, realizations of each, that quickly becomes outside of the order of what a GP could handle. Um, yeah, and so this is kind of a full well, computational workaround. And also, it turns out that sort of modeling these basis weights using a GP actually can outperform sort of directly modeling uh, the curve itself as a GP. Um, and there's some, some papers that have been published on that that I'm happy to share. So what is a Gaussian process? Um, here I'm showing again kind of the words and equations form, and I'll, I'll show the picture in another slide. But uh, here I'm using new equations, so I'm sorry about not being consistent, but uh, here y is uh, some univariate function of some d-dimensional theta, uh, and a, a zero mean squared exponential covariance Gaussian process says that any collection of y's at any collection of thetas is distributed using this um, equation below, where you have that your y's are normal, uh, mean zero, as I mentioned, and this sigma squared r of theta is your squared exponential covariance kernel. And the kernel uh, is defined such that for any pair of inputs here, these are indexed by i and j, you can define that uh, covariance. Um, so yeah, I think I find pictures a little bit uh, nicer. So here's an example of what draws from a Gaussian process look like. Um, this is for, again, a squared exponential covariance kernel. Uh, this is from this nice uh, online resource that allows you to visualize GPs. Um, the, the idea here is that a Gaussian process is a prior over functions. So when you draw from a GP or model something using a GP, you're assuming uh, functional you know, draws and functional realizations. So GPs have a lot of nice features. Uh, there, there's continuity. So your uh, kernel goes to zero as the, oh, sorry, this should say one. Your <laughs> r, r goes to one as uh, the distance between your inputs goes to zero. Um, yeah, and the, the covariance matrix itself, again, just a visual, visual representation below for uh, a 10 dimensional, function, so 10 uh, different inputs, is that for each pair of inputs, you can just directly calculate the value for R. And again, yeah, sorry about the wrong value up top. Uh, another nice Gaussian process feature is that the parameters drive the properties. So here, beta drives how wiggly the function is allowed to be. Um, this is showing if uh, the length scale, um, which is the inverse of beta, is uh, large. This is showing if it's small, um, more wiggly. The other handy thing is that I'm showing for squared exponential, but you can use a different kernel, so a different function for r altogether. Um, and that can get you things like uh, you know, different levels of differentiability and periodicity, uh, et cetera. So the other nice thing uh, about GPs is that the conditional distributions are uh, very straightforward and have an analytical form. And this is how people use GPs for prediction. So say Y1 are some points that you want to predict and Y2 are some points that you observe. Uh, if you scrape the Wikipedia article on Gaussian distributions, you can see that the conditional distribution of y1 given y2 has a closed form formula. <clears throat> and yeah, why is this nice? Um, well, here r is a function of our inputs theta, which we know. So we can compute everything here for new points. The, the mean for a new point, which is uh, shown here, is a weighted average of the observed points. So y2 are our observed points. And the, the mean goes to the value of the observed point as the new point approaches that observed point. Um, 
yeah, so so basically the behavior is kind of as you would expect and hope for. Um, the variance of a new point goes to zero under this formulation as it gets closer to an observed point as well. Um, so what does that look like? On the top here are some unconditional Gaussian process draws. Uh, in the middle, we're assuming that this is the actual function, this blue line, and we observe these three points along that line. And then when we look at conditional draws from the GP, so draws conditioning on these three red points, um, you can see that the uncertainty is pretty heavily constrained. And again, you approach the observed point um, as the input nears it, and you are less certain the further from those points you are. So I talked about how it was nice that you could control you know, how wiggly a function is um, and how differentiable it is, but there, there is an important piece, which is estimation. So you need to actually estimate uh, those parameters that control things like the, the variance and the wiggliness. Um, maximum likelihood is a common, ways, common way to do this. Uh, the Bayesian approach, also popular. Um, the software for the Bayesian approach, which is based on this Kennedy and O'Hagan um, and Higdon et al. papers, is called Sepia. Um, it came out of my group at LAML and is uh, also publicly available on LAML's Git repo. So if anyone needs to do sort of this functional um, model, the basis weights using GPs, Sepia is an awesome way to do it. It's a uh, Python code, so very user friendly. So yeah, going back to what we were trying to do originally, we had our standardized spectrum that we were modeling um, as being approximately uh, this orthogonal basis times these basis weights. And I'm I'm glossing over a noise piece, but there is a uh, a source of noise due to the uh, orthogonal basis representation. Um, and we are also modeling sort of differing noise across the basis weights and overall for this uh, basis representation. But that's in the paper if you want to look at more details. I'm happy to talk about it more. Uh, but yeah, this, this piece that we've been talking about is the basis weights uh, being represented as a GP. So what we do uh, in the code is you learn parameters of the GP, um, and then you predict each WJ star, which here is a basis weight at a new input, given your uh, set of learned uh, parameters and your observed basis weights using conditional normal theory, and then you have predictions. So you have standardized uh, spectra predictions at these new inputs which is just the product of your basis and your predicted weights. So here's an example of what a prediction from the emulator looks like. This is uh, the prediction for the M000 holdout cosmology, which um, is the Lambda CDM cosmology. So the uh, current best guess for what the actual universe looks like. The simulation, so the, the truth um, is purple and the emulator is this dashed yellow line on top. So uh, they look fairly indistinguishable, which is not a mistake. The errors, um, I believe less than 1% for the M000 cosmology. So um, it performs quite well um, for that region of the, the space. Um, I haven't really talked much about sort of like how we've done relative to competitors uh, since this was more meant to be kind of a this is how you do this talk, but the the performance relative to competitors of the cosmic emu is quite good. So our method, the cosmic emu, is uh, the black line, and sorry, these are a little bit hard to to distinguish, but. Um, we're also showing the results for the Baco emulator, 
for Halo Fit and Bird, um, which are from CAM, the Euclid Emulator 2, um, Takahashi's implementation uh, of the Halo Fit model, um, and HM Code 2020. And Basically, the takeaway here is that the Cosmic Emu kind of outperforms all of these competitors. Uh, this is, again, for the M000 cosmology for uh, Redshift 0. And um, the actual paper you know, includes results for uh, multiple Redshifts, and the Cosmic Emu itself can predict for, for multiple Redshifts. But uh, I'm just cherry picking sort of one example. Um, yeah, and so the, the y-axis on this plot shows the percent error in predicting this M000 cosmology. Um, one is exact agreement to simulation, 1.05 is 5% error. Uh, as I mentioned, the worst case for our emulator is 1%, uh, and compare that to competitors that for uh, all redshifts range from 3% to 11%. Um, so are, yeah, much, much lower performing. Um, another kind of advantage to the Cosmic Emu is that it has a, a much wider range of parameter values that it accepts. So the, the space of cosmologies you can explore is broader than for the other sort of like well or better performing uh, implementations. So BACO, for example, can't go up to as high of K or uh, as wide a uh, array of possible redshifts. Um, and the, let's see, I think the non HM code 2020 uh, implementations also can't handle many of the, the test cosmologies because certain parameter values are outside of the allowed ranges. Um, yeah, so not only is it kind of one of the only options for a lot of possible cosmologies, but it performs well, uh, even when it's not. Yeah, so uh, some cosmic emu specific discussion. Gaussian processes in PCA aren't the only way, but they are pretty good, uh, as I have attempted to show. Um, yeah, computational complexity can be a challenge. so. We had 111 cosmologies, but if our input space became much larger, so in the order of like thousands of cosmologies that we were using to train, that could really bog down a model that's based on Gaussian processes um, or on exact Gaussian processes. And then, yeah, actually using the emulator for parameter inference uh, model calibration is a whole other talk, um, but that that is one of the big goals for building this is to allow and enable uh, people to do that calibration. Um, yeah, the so PCA and GPs, as I mentioned, are great. There's a lot of uses and extensions to dimension reduction approaches and Gaussian processes. Uh, you can handle binary data, count data, discontinuities, random outputs, incomplete outputs, uh, whatever you have. And so yeah, this, this is kind of closes the cosmic emu part of my talk. And then I um, have a couple of just sort of one slides talking about other work that I've done that uses GPs and or dimension reduction. Um, but I'll, I'll pause maybe here and see if there are any cosmic emu questions before I move on to those other uh, applications. I think that you, you probably get like a lot of questions on Cosmic Emu at, at the end. So, so maybe if you want to talk about the other applications, it might be best to do that now and then sure. we'll, we'll discuss everything at the end. I yeah. think that's, that's just my feeling. Okay. Yeah, so uh, here's, here's one example that includes both dimension reduction and Gaussian processes. Um, when I was in grad school, I did some work on jointly modeling chemical structure and dose response profiles. And this was a, a project with someone at the EPA. Um, and the, yeah, the kind of interesting motivating piece is that the US has this thing called the Toxic Substances Control Act. And I think it was in 1976 or the, the 70s sometime when um, 
Congress passed this act that basically said like, hey, I know there's bunches of chemicals out there, like, you know, 60,000, 70,000 different chemicals uh, that are currently in use. And anything that's in use is kind of grandfathered in and continued safe or considered safe until proven otherwise. Um, and so now there's like this sort of backlog of all these like so-called safe chemicals and the, yeah, the so the question is like, you know, the EPA A doesn't actually, uh, I think, think that all of those are truly safe, um, but also doesn't have time to fully test either in animals or like in culture, um, every single possible substance that has been grandfathered in via this Toxic Substances Control Act. So there's this hope that maybe sort of similar to with the Cosmic Emu, we can take some of our, our observed, um, actually tested chemical set and then predict for other chemicals whether we should be worried about them. Um, yeah, so, so what I did was build this quantitative structure activity relationship model um, in which I related uh, the structure to the dose response profiles for chemicals. Um, so like at a given dose, how active is that chemical using this latent factor model? Um, and here I'm just showing the component for the dose response profiles, which uh, are denoted by Y here, which isn't super important, but the, yeah, the, the dose response profiles are modeled using some mean, and then this latent factor model for this shared um, component eta, which is the sort of underlying structure activity space is how you can think of it. And the way that that structure activity space is mapped to the dose response profiles is via this factor loadings matrix lambda. And lambda itself is modeled using Gaussian processes for the columns. Um, with a shrinkage prior to encourage, you know, as few sort of active columns as possible. And what that means is that you have sort of a mapping from your uh, latent structure activity space to the dose response profiles that's built by using smooth functions. So your resulting dose response profile will be smooth. Um, so that, yeah, there's a, there's a paper on that if anyone is interested, but that's sort of the skeleton of the idea. Um, another thing that I worked on uh, a couple of years ago is this hierarchical factor regression model to infer cause of death from verbal autopsy data. Um, and the idea here was that in sort of um, many countries, there isn't either the resources, uh, the expertise, or the opportunity to do a complete post-mortem on everybody who dies. Um, so there are many people who die without either an assigned cause of death or an opportunity to like learn a cause of death. So there are efforts to try to mitigate uh, or rectify that situation using verbal autopsies, which are sort of structured interviews with the loved ones of people who have died. Um, and yeah, the, the question then becomes sort of, okay, so if you have these structured interview results, how do you then take those structured interviews and get to a cause of death assignment? Um, and there were uh, a handful of other models put out for how to do this, some of which uh, performed quite well, but the, the sort of piece that was missing uh, that I noticed was uh, the allowance for information to be shared across causes of death um, and also for there to be um, in the model structure on the covariance of symptoms. So uh, yeah, the that's, that's sort of like the two motivating pieces. And then the result was uh, this model that uh, I worked on where you modeled the, uh, this is the, the latent continuous symptom vector, which isn't super important, but the, the idea was that the, the space of symptoms you modeled again using this factor model, which is 
uh, kind of like PCA. Um, and that factor model itself had a hierarchical component where the loadings matrix, which defines sort of the covariance between symptoms, um, was allowed to share information across causes and the latent uh, set of weights. So here, this is like a lower dimensional representation of the symptom vector, if you can think of it, um, also was allowed to share information across symptoms. Um, yeah, and, and so this is also a more parsimonious representation of that symptom vector. So maybe if someone has the flu, you don't need to know that they had body chills, body aches, fever for two weeks, fever for one week. Maybe it was enough to know that they had sort of like febrile symptoms. And that's sort of what is captured in this latent representation. Um, so this plot down here is just showing the results for uh, what this latent mean uh, is for a set of um, causes of death. And yeah, if you look at homicide, uh, for example, cough, fever, and weight loss, uh, not indicative of a homicide death, but violent injury very much is, and vice versa for cirrhosis and pneumonia. Yeah, so thanks for indulging me uh, in talking about some of my former, more global health related work. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna open the floor up again for questions and any discussion. Great, thanks very much. Oops, sorry. Okay, so seeing as most of the people joining are online, I'd say if anybody in the room's got a question, just stick your hand up. Um, if anyone online has a question, just do the same thing. Um, either write a question in the chat or use the raise hand feature and I'll, I'll call upon you to ask your question. So anyone in the room have a question? Okay, let's go with uh, John. So uh, for when you were testing cosmic emu, was that primarily on dark matter only simulations or did you include simulations that had effects for baryons and feedback? Can you, sorry, can you repeat the end of your question? Oh, sorry, let me, let me, let me, let me do this, okay. Okay, can, can you hear the microphone? Uh, yes. Okay. So I, I just asked, um, when you were testing Cosmic Emu and developing it, did you only run it on dark matter only simulations or did you include any that in, had sort of uh, baryon effects or feedback processes involved? Oh, good question. Um, I should know the answer to this off the top of my head, but I don't actually remember. I'm not a particularly good cosmologist, but I think our paper specified that. I want to say we don't include any baryon effects um, and that we are including those in our runs that we are presently doing. Um, but I should double check that that is actually true. Okay. I, I don't know if uh, Juliana is in the same Zoom box that Amal is in, but if she is, maybe she can, maybe she can say. Oh yeah, Juliana would know better. You out there, Juliana? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Hello, hi, Kelly. So, no, though these are dark matter only simulations that Neo Titan is currently built upon. I'm not sure if there are plans for hydro simulations as well. I think yeah, the the new SIDAC is hydro as well. Um, but I'm not sure what the progress is on sort of how many of those they've started yet. David Yeah. Okay, uh, David. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was interested when you're applying your smoothing techniques, the um, how what level do you match those to the smoothness seen in observational data? 
And the second question, if I may, um, how do you ensure continuity and continuity of the slopes uh, in this? So, um, you know, what, what is the, um, you know, do, do you try, because obviously when you've got um, functions that, you know, you're picking from the Gaussians and so on, uh, you know, sort of how do you match them up um, between segments if you are splitting them up into segments? Yeah, great question. Um, so let's see, the first part of your question, can you- right, so to, 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 to Basically, how smooth is the data to which you are trying to match your simulation? And can uh, do, do you use that as an input? Yeah, okay, so no, the, um, the model only uses the simulation runs for inputs. So the, the parameters are not pre-specified so we don't say like this is how smooth or like wiggly the function should be a priori um the model learns that from the simulations um and the yeah the second piece the matching uh at those join points is kind of i i treated it as two separate steps um i should maybe share the slide with this, but the there's not actually sort of a distinct, you model this section separate from this section, separate from this section. The entire model includes sort of just a truncation term that is wrapped up. Let me pull up the slide for that. Mm. Can you still see my slide? I know it's not. Yes, working. thank you. Yeah, so um, this, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, realizations of a given sort of simulation or perturbation theory, we're modeling these all sort of as though they are coming from the same functional form. Uh, but AS here is a truncation matrix that accounts for, you know, if you're cutting it off at 0.04, say for the perturbation theory runs. And the this smooth function is sort of like jointly learned from all of those. So that join point is smooth always by definition um, in the model. We're not treating each as sort of its own like chunk to be modeled. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see that Alex has sound up in the audience. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering about the um, point where you uh, were joining the models, um, obviously, because you've used rough model, um, detailed model, and also the um, prediction of the um, uh, analytical formula, uh, how you weighted them against each other, uh, particularly in the middle region where you've you have um, detailed and rough models? Yeah, so um, the precision here is learned. So um, I believe in an earlier iteration of this, the precisions were supposed to be analytically like determinable from the simulations. Um, and that I think never came to fruition. So what we're doing is we're sort of using the low res uh, realizations as uh, as sort of a like proxy by which we can get at the noise for those realizations. Um, and so the yeah the the underlying smooth function you know has some noise about it for the low res and for the high res, and that lives in this sigma matrix here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but the the way that they're like joined implicitly gives more weight to the more precise components. So the perturbation theory we're saying is, you know, incredibly precise, like the precisions, uh, you know, 10 to the, the 12 or something. 
um, and just fixing that basically as truth. And then the, the learned sort of precisions for the low res and the high res sims make it such that implicitly in the model, those low res simulations have less weight than the high res simulation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I had a couple of questions. If there's nobody, nobody else has got some. Um, so, so on your slide on toxicology, just just to make sure I've understood it right. So, so the model you were building was um, so you, you sort of know what your your kind of training data is like a certain number of like low dose responses for given chemicals. And what you're predicting is what would happen if you had higher doses or if you had doses in between your training points. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So. Um... The, the training set is from this set of assays that were run um, on, I think it was a few thousand chemicals um, where you have dose response profiles or some observations from the dose response function for those chemicals. And mm -hmm. the idea was to predict for new chemicals and to get sort of a full dose response profile for a given chemical, because you may only see like, a couple of points along that curve for any given chemical. Right. So, so you're building models for entirely new chemicals that your emulator is not seeing. Yes. How how accurate can that be? Because you you know, I just, I just need to think of something like say thalidomide, right, which works perfectly fine for one chirality, but then when you flip it, it's kind of horribly dangerous. And would your emulator pick that up? Yeah, I think so. It depends on, with that particular example, probably not. Um, I think it depends on if the training set includes sort of like bad actors and enough of them that have a certain property that the model can learn. So if there's a, a way in which a chemical is dangerous that the model doesn't see, it's not probably not gonna guess um, yeah. for new chemicals, but uh, in terms of performance, like this particular method predicted better than some other common QSAR approaches in a holdout set for this specific set of assays. Um, so like, I think this model, again, is not really like itself going to be a standalone save you from all of the possible dangerous chemicals, but I think the concept of sort of this joint modeling of the structure and dose response is fairly novel um, mm -hmm. in that world, at least, and is a helpful building block on the road to sort of not only modeling in vitro um, assays and predicting for in vitro assays, but doing a joint model that includes like in vitro results with in vivo studies, so studies actually done on animals or observational results in people. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's like, it performed pretty well, but again, as, as a standalone, I don't think it's going to actually address this issue by itself. I see. So, so you could kind of validate the models after the fact by having follow-up experimentation, but just at a few kind of testing points. Yeah. And, and I think the, the piece of the model that's still missing is like linking to other types of studies. So linking to different types of assays or linking to um, already performed in vivo studies, not necessarily like running new studies just to validate the model. Okay. And are these um, dose response file, uh, sorry, dose response profiles necessarily smooth? Do you, do you get things like uh, kind of tipping points or discontinuities with, with humans where if you, know, if you cross some threshold suddenly the response to it com completely changes? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the assumption of smoothness is one that's commonly made by other, like by toxicologists, I guess, is the cop-out answer. Um, the actual answer, I think, would be it depends on what endpoint, like, the, the assay is looking at, so what the response is. Um, I think it's often fairly smooth in these sort of in vitro assays that the, the EPA has put out. Um, another kind of interesting question 
is whether or not the shape of uh, those smooth functions should be monotonic. Um, there are people who very strongly believe that uh, there is no such thing as hermesis, which is like a downturn at the end of a dose response profile. And that if that is apparent in data, it's an artifact. Um, there's other people who think that it's super important. So that was kind of a, we, we didn't include monotonicity, but that also was sort of a choice that some people would agree with and others wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Is there any danger of um, overinterpretation on, on the on the um, on the part of like the regulators or some of the manufacturers of these chemicals, where they they might look at um, kind of models, not not just your own ones as well, and say, look, this this shows that everything's fine, and then can rubber stamp it without necessarily doing you know uh, due to, well doing the full due diligence. Yeah, I think. I would be surprised if people trusted models that much. Um, I would say the risk would maybe be more that people would look at just in vitro results and rubber stamp it, which I think is maybe like a layer. So modeling is kind of like the most removed from um, yeah. putting a chemical in a human and then like test tube is another layer sort of closer to humans. But I think like, yeah, the if you just run in a test tube and there's no reaction, I would be a little worried about like yeah. that not necessarily being reflective of how a human body would respond. But I guess um I think like yeah, pragmatically given again the backlog of how many chemicals are currently rubber stamped, it's just not realistic to do the full testing on all of them. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really important, fascinating work. Like, I, I don't know if you've seen that um, film, Dark Waters. I don't know if it's a TV show or, or a film. Uh, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Like, um, some chemical that was assumed to be safe you know, builds up in, like, uh, standing water, in, I think, in sort of mining towns in, in Virginia. It ends up kind of poisoning the you know, populace over, over decades. and uh, the arguments of whether it's safe or not and all that kind of stuff. I, I think that's put me in like a slightly paranoid frame of mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I read some interesting like just blog science articles about accumulation of uh, different substances at lower elevations because you have like runoff from all of the higher yeah. elevation places. And it did make me kind of glad to be living in northern New Mexico, which is pretty yeah. high. It's, it's really scary. I mean, we've we've sort of come up with all these solutions to all these problems over the past 100 years, which are chemical, and we don't really know what the long-term consequences of them are. Yeah. Um, I suppose I had like one last little question before we go, unless anybody else has, has anything. It's not. Um, so you, you, you're talking about the uh, the basis weights for the most part. Um, so the orthogonal bases themselves, are, are they um, like basis poly polynomials or um, um, some other functional form that acts as bases? Yeah, it's just um, straightforward singular value decomposition of the matrix of smooth spectra. So it's, you know, analytic pre-calculated. Um, the question of whether other basis choices or like bases modeled as a component of sort of this bigger modeling process would do better is interesting. Um, we're kind of looking at that now with maybe treating the basis itself also as a thing to be learned, like probabilistic PCA style. Um, and that's so that we can account for partial observations. So if we want to include, say, uh, perturbation theory only results for a set of cosmologies to try to improve predictive performance. Um, yeah, then maybe it's more appropriate to sort of learn a basis in the modeling framework rather than pre specify an orthogonal basis. Okay, thank you.
Okay, well, I think we've we've kept you for an, enough of your morning. Um, so our, our work day is finishing, your your day is just beginning, I imagine. So yeah, thank you again um, for your time. Uh, it was a real pleasure listening to you and um, your research. So. Thank you. Yeah, it was good to, good to meet everyone.